Scripture reading for today is Mark 1 through 6. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil, to save to save life or to kill, but they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distri- distressed at their sub, sub stubborn hearts. Said to the man, "Stretch out your hand." He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the he- Herodians how they might kill Jesus. May God have, uh, add a blessing to his word. Amen. We are in Mark chapter 3. It's a rather interesting chapter. There is a passage in Mark chapter 3 describing Jesus as being angry. We'll spend a moment with that. It also reminds us that there are only three options that you can choose from when you consider who Jesus is. And it concludes with the explanation Jesus gives for what is called the unforgivable sin. Seems like a lot of material to cover, but we'll see what we can do. Last Sabbath, we looked at four clashes between Jesus and the Jews, uh, particularly the Pharisees. And in our scripture reading that Daniel gave, he recounted the fifth in that series of confrontations between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees. On Sabbath, Jesus enters the synagogue and there is a man with a deformed hand. The Pharisees are closely watching Jesus, seeking to find something that they can use against him. They're hoping he will break their laws. Scribes and the Pharisees don't like Jesus. So Jesus asks the man to come forward. If you want to follow along, we're in Mark chapter 3, verse 4. And Jesus said to them, the Pharisees and the scribes, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or kill? Now, what you may not know, and I didn't until I was preparing for today, is that Jewish oral traditions told of numerous medical conditions which could not be healed on the Sabbath. Now that just fries my mind. A group of people have decided, if you got this illness, we can help you. If you got that illness, well, too bad, just suffer. So these oral traditions made by the scribes and the Pharisees are why the crowd, back in Mark chapter 1, verses 32 through 34, waited till after sundown to go to the house where Jesus was so they could be healed. Because they must have had the bad kind of illness, which couldn't be healed on the Sabbath. Back in Mark 3, verse 4, Jesus asks a question, but they kept silent. They don't answer the question. Jesus, of course, anticipated that. Now I want you to carefully notice verse 5. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. So when he, Jesus, had looked around at them, Pharisees and scribes, with anger, the Son of God is angry with scribes and Pharisees. Being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. That's why Jesus is angry. They have hard hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole, just as good as the other. 
Jesus is angry with the scribes and the Pharisees because they have a hard heart and they're apathetic towards the suffering of one of their brothers. Now, the Greek we translate as anger in verse 5 literally means righteous indignation. Righteous people can become angry. Jesus did. I might go so far as to say righteous people should become angry because Jesus did. Things like violence, prejudice, rape, injustice, domestic violence, child abuse, and other circumstances should generate some sort of righteous indignation in the children of God. But we have become so accustomed that we just go, yeah, that's society, and we'll move on. As we're thinking about this righteous indignation that Jesus is having towards the scribes and the Pharisees, I want you to turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. As you're going down the straight and narrow path, there are ditches on either side, and Satan doesn't care which ditch you're in as long as you're not on the narrow and straight path. So i got to talk to you a minute about Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Because I don't want you leaving here saying, well, the pastor said I'm supposed to get mad at people. (laughs) I have a video record of what I said, so don't bring that up. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your words, nor give place to the devil. Here's the key for children of God. We are not to let our anger lead us to do something revengeful or sinful. But you can't get angry. I want you to notice that Jesus is angry with the Pharisees because they have hard hearts and they don't care about people. They're more concerned about maintaining the status quo, which keeps them at the top. Nothing upsets Jesus like the hard hearts of people who have no compassion. That's what angers our Savior. And if we're going to act like children of God, then we need to be sensitive to and alleviate that which angers our Master. Humiliated by the power and the compassion of Jesus, the Pharisees do something really quite rare. They cooperate with the Herodians. Now we read that and like, yeah, okay, they're cooperating with the Herodians. You need to understand who the Herodians are. Because the Pharisees cooperating with the Herodians is unthinkable. They are the group who support the Herods. The Herods are those people, that family, hand-picked by the Romans to be the leaders of the Jewish people. They are the puppet government. The Pharisees, usually, under other circumstances, couldn't stand the Herodians. The Pharisees are nationalists. They want to kick Rome and their army out of the land and return to the great kingdom that Israel once was. So we got this group of nationalists getting in bed with the leaders appointed by the enemy. They must really not like Jesus. So the Pharisees have really kind of slipped down the slippery slope. But it gets more scary. The Pharisees in Mark 3, the beginning, are accusing Jesus of breaking the Sabbath law by healing a man. Yet they're plotting to kill. Pharisees don't have righteous indignation. They have an evil anger which is leading them to sin. So after this incident, Jesus withdraws with his followers. 
As news of his miracles spread, a large crowd gathers around him. Always there's a large crowd around him. Jesus continues to heal many and cast out demons. Those who are possessed by those demons or evil spirits cast their hosts on the ground in front of Jesus. Go to Mark 3, verses 11 and 12. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw Jesus, fell down before him and cried out, saying, Are you the Son of God? But he sternly warned them they should not make him known. Excuse me. Jesus commands the evil spirits not to reveal who he is because it seems he wants to control his self-disclosure. Excuse me. Oh, yeah, up, that's good. Somebody should have said that was pretty good reactions, by the way. I could have been a goalie on Kirk's soccer team. Now if I only knew where I was. Oh, yeah, the Masonic secret. Jesus is talking to anyone he heals... Not to spread who he is. He tells the demons that he casts out of people not to spread who he is. Now Mark is unique in sharing this fact with us. Okay? The first half of the gospel, Jesus is doing this information control, or at least trying. And the Bible commentators, or commentaries, struggle to tell you us exactly why he's doing this. The census seems to be that Jesus doesn't want his messiahship known to the crowd because he knows most in the crowd won't accept him as the Son of God till his crucifixion and resurrection. So this thing called the Masonic secret is in the book of Mark, but don't worry about it because if you don't understand it, the experts don't either. It's something I said. Also during this time, Jesus goes up on the mountain. I'm in verses 13 through 15. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. These are the twelve disciples. Okay? Back, way back, in 2012, we did a series on each of the disciples. If you want those sermons, send me an email and I'll dust off my computer files and find them. Jesus begins the Christian era with 12 disciples, much like the nation of Israel started with 12 brothers, one of which became the Old Testament priesthood. But I want you to understand and always remember That Jesus wants all of us to be his priests. Find 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter says, but you are a chosen generation. The Greek we translate as you in verse 9 is a plural pronoun. He's talking to all of us. But we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We were once not a people, but now are the people of God. So, all of us who claim to be Christians should live a life worthy of that title. The first characteristic we can get from Mark chapter 3 is we should work at alleviating the thing that makes our master mad. A hardened heart and an apathetic attitude. Now, years ago in the beginning of my military career, I learned a law of success that applies to being a child of God. The law is work 
your boss's issues. You want to be successful wherever you are, figure out what's your number one issue of your boss, solve that problem, you'll be as good as gold. The issue Jesus has here is people have hard hearts, they have apathetic hearts, and if we're going to work his issues, we have to understand that those hard hearts and apathetic hearts can't be in us. The Holy Spirit stands ready to give you a heart transplant, but he's waiting on your permission. Here's the point. To be a successful disciple and priest, you have to alleviate what makes Jesus mad. The apathetic, unconcerned heart that might be in you. God's family members should be concerned about what concerns their master. The second action I want us to think about from Mark chapter 3 is concentrate on who Jesus is. You might know the author C.S. Lewis. He is an early 20th century author. He's also a pretty well-developed lay theologian. He wrote books about that kind of stuff. And he came up with this line that you have probably heard. Jesus is either a lunatic, a liar, or the Lord. You only got three choices, and every one of us picks one. Jesus is either a lunatic, a liar, or the Lord. My dad thinks he's a lunatic, just so you know. Individually, we each have to decide. Is Jesus mad, is he bad, or is he in fact the Son of God? As Mark chapter 3 continues, Jesus enters a house where a huge crowd has gathered. There are so many people, he's unable to eat. Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Oops, Mark chapter 3, verse 20. And the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, these are the followers of Jesus, probably the twelve or some of his family. Most experts think it's some of his family. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Notice what the experts in the Mosaic law think about Jesus. Verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He's Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Beelzebub was a Canaanite deity in 2 Kings chapter 1, but by the time this event takes place in the first century, the name had kind of morphed and become a label that we use to describe the rulers of demons. You and I would call him Satan. Religious leaders can't deny the power that Jesus has to do the miracles that he's already done in the Gospel of Mark. But they can refuse to believe that his power comes from God. The power he's using, so the scribes assert, comes from Satan. They accuse him of Jesus of being possessed by Satan himself. Now, Jesus reveals the silliness of that logic in verses 23 through 26. So Jesus called them to him, them the scribes, and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? <laughs> Duh. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. Now, some of you who are historians or enjoy history, those passages should sound familiar to you. Okay? Before he was our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln used those passages in a speech he gave in 1858 when he was a congressman from Illinois. The house divided speech, if you care. So, 
Jesus reminds us what we already know. Verse 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder the house. You and I need to understand and take great comfort in knowing that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Therefore, he's able to bind Satan and drive out the demons of those people who are possessed. God still binds the power of evil today. Go over to 1 John chapter 4. Look with me at verse 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So Jesus is the Son of God. And I want you to remember the context that we just went through describes believing that he's a demonic deceiver because it's in this context that Jesus explains the unforgivable sin. Jesus doesn't explain the unforgivable sin in the context of murder or adultery, which King David was guilty of but yet was forgiven. Jesus doesn't explain it in the context of denying he is the Christ, which Peter was later guilty of, but was forgiven. He explains it in the context of attributing to Satan the power the Holy Spirit possesses. Jesus starts his explanation in verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. Now, before we go on, let's stop. All sins are forgivable, verse 28 says. It doesn't say all except. It says all. Most of us, when we think about the unforgivable sin, focus so much on verse 29, we forget the per promise of verse 28. We forget that Jesus says all sins can be forgiven if we know from elsewhere in Scripture, if we repent and accept him as our Lord and Savior. So what is the only unforgivable sin? Verse 29 and 30. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. Blasphemies is a transliteration of a Greek word, means to speak evil. The unforgivable sin is when we speak evil about the Holy Spirit. In the context of this passage, it's done when we attribute to Satan the power solely reserved for the Holy Spirit. Such a sin would be easily committed by one whose heart is hardened or apathetic. If I have a hard heart, I don't care what God's word says. I don't care what the Holy Spirit does. I'll say almost anything because I don't care. Every pastor I know, every single pastor I know has had someone come to them and say, I think I've committed the unforgivable sin. The saint explains to the pastor the actions that he or she may have done and asks what the people Pastor thinks. The pastor's universal response is, if you had committed the unforgivable sin, you wouldn't be here asking me what I think. Because you wouldn't care what I think. I could tell you some stories, but I won't. Like the scribes in our passage, people who do commit the unforgivable sin simply don't care that they have. They won't ask about it. That doesn't even enter their awareness. They simply don't care. 
Mark stresses Jesus is addressing his words to the scribes. Look at verse 30 again. Because they, the scribes, said Jesus has an unclean spirit. That's the power by which he is doing the miracles and casting out the demons. Every one of us has to choose who Jesus is. He, he is either deluded, demonic, or a deity. And what you choose, what you believe, governs what you act like. To live like a member of the family of Jesus, you have to alleviate what makes Jesus angry, that unconcerned, hard heart. You also have to concentrate on who he really is, the only begotten son of God. And thirdly, you have to cooperate with God and work within the will of God. Look at verse 31. Then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside, they sent to him, sent to him, calling him. Jesus had several half-brothers by this time. For example, James, the guy who wrote the epistle later in the New Testament. And here, the crowd hears biological mother, hears biological brothers calling out to Jesus. Jesus looks at those sitting around him and says a rather profound statement. Drop down to verse 34. He looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Jesus is stressing that the relationship of his spiritual family is more important and longer lasting than those of his biological family. When you and I do the will of God, we are closer to Jesus than his mother. Now, I hope you have a good relationship with your mother or at least fond memories of her. When we do the will of God, we are closer and more important to Jesus than his biological mother. So what, you ask, is the will of God? I'm glad you asked. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, For this is the will of God, our sanctification. There's at least 22 sermons in those seven words. We don't have that much time this morning. Some of us are about ready to faint from the heat back there. That's good. I'm glad I'm not the only hot one. That's good. I appreciate your affirmation. So what is the will of God? Our Sanctification. Sanctification denotes the process of becoming more and more holy. Becoming more and more like Jesus. Becoming more and more like God. In fact, this holy idea is communicated in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. For God did not call us to uncleanliness, but in holiness. It's the same Greek word that we translated back up in verse 3. Sanctification is that lifelong process of becoming more and more like a member of God's family. And I don't care how far you've come along that journey, you've got a long way to go. I've done this illustration before, but I haven't moved around much, so I'll do it again. Sanctification is starting wherever you is and getting to be like Jesus over there and you go half the distance every day. Wherever you are compared to where Jesus is and you go half the distance every day. Day one. You're so proud of yourself. Like, oh, wow. Day two, half the distance. 
This is easy. This is a piece of cake. I'm going to do it. Oh, I'm well on my way. Day three, half the distance. If you haven't figured it out, you never get there. Because you're always going half the distance. It could be 733 years. You'll really be old, but you won't get there. Because you never quite reach it. Sanctification isn't arriving. It's the process. That's the will of God. And if you're in the will of God, cooperating with the Holy Spirit in being sanctified, you are more valuable and important and loved by Jesus than his own mother. Remember, Jesus is either a loon, a liar, or the Lord. And each of us have to decide that for ourselves. Find Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 30. Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. And he says, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. In the great conflict for our souls, there is no middle ground. No sitting on the fence. Either you is or you ain't. Either you are a child of God or you're not. You can pretend like it's Halloween and get dressed up in a costume and play the part. But either you is or you ain't. In other words, we're either a part of the spiritual family of Jesus or we are his opposition. We either work with Jesus or we work against him. This quote is too long for a slide, so I'm just going to read it to you. Hopefully you'll listen. When the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of the new heart. No longer that hard, apathetic heart. A change is worked which man can never accomplish for himself. It is a supernatural work beginning a supernatural, I'm sorry, bringing a supernatural element into our human nature. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress, his own, Christ's own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world and he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. He's con describing the condition of our new heart. A soul that thus kept in possession by the heavenly agency is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. Unless, of course, you choose to go to the other side. But unless we do yield ourselves to the control of Christ, we shall be dominated by the wicked one. There is no middle ground. Either you is or you ain't. We must inevitably be under the control of the one or the other of the two great powers that are contending for the supremacy of the world. There is no middle ground. If you choose to be a member of the spiritual family of Jesus, then he expects you to act like it. By the fruit of you shall know them. I think Susan, I kind of hosed her earlier. I'll do a nice thing for her. I don't know if she said it, but it makes my conscience feel better. <laughs> We're at prayer meeting, I think, this week. Somewhere this week, she said, even if you glue apples onto a tree, it doesn't make it an apple tree. <laughs> the apples come from within the tree. If we're going to be a member of Christ's spiritual family, then with that changed heart, the apples will come out naturally. 
If we choose to be a member of his family, then we will act like it by alleviating those things that anger our master. And we can start with our own hard heart. If we're going to be a member of Jesus' spiritual family, then we have to concentrate on who our master really is. We have to concentrate on what motivates him, and we have to ask the Holy Spirit to be more like him. If we choose to be a member of the spiritual family of Jesus, then we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and operate within the will of our master. We have to be on that sanctification journey that never ends. The choice is ours. We either are with him or we are against him. Our closing hymn is number 86, How Great Thou Art. Please stand for a closing hymn, number 86.
need something to do this afternoon, go home and read chapter 33 of the Desire of Ages. Let's pray. Your gracious Heavenly Father, you are indeed great. That you would take time to be concerned with sinners like us. Amen. Lord, we want desperately to be more like Jesus. Amen. Lord, agitate our hearts until we invite the Holy Spirit in. That we surrender control of our lives. And that we do become more like Jesus. And may he come soon to take us home is our prayer in his name. Amen. Amen.